And Pauly takes a unique approach to identity governance and administration. And Pauly delivers what is known as compliant access. Any identity management system can deliver access, can be responsible for provisioning and deprovisioning into target systems based on rules. But compliant access delivery is a new approach to delivering this technical access. What is compliant access? Well, compliant access is access that is appropriate to the person to whom it is assigned and is in compliance with organizational standards and business policies put in place to minimize risk. So compliant access gives the right people the right access while enforcing an organization's risk policies concerning this access. Compliant access delivery is the synthesis of multiple identity and access management technologies with a business modeling approach. The business modeling approach is to model an organization's processes that are performed in the business and the, and, and the technical access that is required to perform these processes. So it synthesizes these two approaches to maintain at all times each user with their appropriate access to IT systems while continuously attempting to minimize risk and to report on risk. Zero trust. Zero trust has become a, a popular uh, buzzword in the industry because it, it delivers such a valuable proposition. Zero trust is not really a technology, but a new way of thinking about security. And Empower ID leverages zero trust principles highly in its delivery of compliant access. Zero trust has three fundamental principles. One is to never trust. Second is to always verify. And third is to always enforce least privilege. Always grant the minimum access for the minimum time period uh, in order to fulfill a user's access requirements. Now, zero trust is based on the idea that identity is the new control plane for access, that it's no longer internal networks versus out, out external networks with firewalls, that identity is what you're controlling, and that all access to systems should be strongly authenticated. So therefore, you must trust this identity. It must be strongly verified. And authorization is extremely important. Authorization is controlling what a person can do, who should have access to what. So authorization based on the identity of the user and also the context of the request. So is the user inside the network, outside the network? Are they on a trusted device uh, that has been proofed and has all the right corporate standards in place uh, to prevent it from being compromised? And also to only grant the minimum access required. So to really change the way you think about access. So if a user needs access to a server to do administration, they really just need access to do administration. So how can they accomplish these tasks with the least amount of network connectivity and physical access appropriate? So Empower ID believes in zero trust. So we believe that you should never have direct, unproxied access if possible. So if you need to remote desktop into a server, why well, have direct, direct network connectivity if you just need access to the server desktop? Uh, same goes for SSH, and the same goes for web applications, HTTPS. Why expose the full network connectivity when you only need a specific access? Also, never expose anything if possible uh, not, uh, without pre-authentication. So your web applications and your other things should have a layer of pre-authentication in front of them so that no um, anonymous program can occur. And also, never rely strictly on primary authentication, which is typically username and password. Always require strong, adaptive, multi-factor authentication before you trust the user's identity. So extending these beliefs, Empower ID believes that a user never requires permanent admin rights. If a user, because why would they need these rights as an open security attack service when they're asleep or when they're not performing their administrative duties? So temporary credentials or temporary elevation of access should be the mantra, delivering the access just in time and just enough. And 
users should never be divulged, if possible, privileged usernames and passwords. Allow them to use these identities without giving away this information, the username and password. So check in, check out of these credentials with rotation or proxied access where it's never revealed to them. One of the major attack searches is, is for users to be local PCs administrators. So do not allow them to be PC administrators because then if they click on a link in an email, it's acting as their user account and it has full access to scoop up privileged hash credentials and other things. Put, put a proxied application in the middle, like privileged application launcher, to allow them to run applications as administrative accounts, but not to act as an administrator in their general session. So how is compliant access delivered? Because policies are great uh, to represent who should be able to do what. Uh, but without the access actually being delivered to the user in the target systems, then it's really just reporting and it's interesting, but it's not nearly as useful. So there are a few different methods uh, of delivering compliant access. Uh, the first would be, be what's called self-enforcement or external authorization. And this is for applications that support calling out to a policy decision point or a centralized authorization service to ask the system, can this user do what they're trying to do? Or what can this user do in this application? This is a great approach because you have one central spot when you model what a person can do based upon all the available organizational data in the identity warehouse. What is their role? What does HR say? What's their status? And the application that they can consume this, then they're always up to date. You know that no rules are hard-coded in these applications. So you have one central spot that you can adjust this access and you can recertify it. Unfortunately, uh, many applications do not support this model. Uh, typically, it's only when customers are developing custom applications that they can make the decision to make them support external authorization. A more common approach is gateway enforcement. And gateway enforcement it's putting some type of gateway in between the user and the systems they're trying to access. So the gateway can mediate the user's access and, and act as an external authorization-enabled app. So it can call out to a policy decision point to ask, can this user do what they're trying to do in this context, in this moment in time? So gateway enforcement adds that layer so the users never directly access those systems. They only get a mediated and, uh, and authorized access, which can force pre-authentication. It can force strong identity verification and multi-factor authorization as well. Uh, two more compliant access delivery methods. Another is claims-based enforcement. So claims-based enforcement is what we'd call a disconnected enforcement model. So th this means that applications can receive claims from a trusted source, typically through an open federation standard such as SAML or OpenID Connect. So they're receiving information about the user from a trusted source, a trusted identity provider that, that delivers information about what authority does this user have in that application. And then the application trusts this information and it enforces security. So it acts as its own policy enforcement point to enforce security decisions based upon this information it's received from the trusted source, but in a disconnected model. It's never calling back to that system. It's relying on the information it received in the claims. And the last one, which is definitely the most common, is for systems that have no concept of enforcing access based upon dynamic claims. They uh, Maybe you can't get in the middle with a gateway, like file share access, mailbox permissions based on ACLs or other things. A lot of systems, you can't put a gateway in the middle that really can control authorization. And they don't support claims. And they definitely don't support calling out for decisions real time. So they don't support a policy decision point. So for those systems, which again make up the bulk of your, your application landscape, you need what's called provisioning engine enforcement or sometimes called push enforcement. Provisioning engine enforcement allows you to model who should have access to what, compliant access, based upon what a person does in the organization, what requests they've made that have been approved and are still valid, 
and also your risk policies and to recalculate the result of this continuously and to push down the result onto the target systems. So to deliver this uh, provisioning engine enforcement, you need to have a system where you can model compliant access, which also knows their current access. So it knows how to make the changes, what needs to be revoked at any time, and what needs to be granted, whether it's for a short time period or it's permanent access. So one of the gateway approaches to delivering access, just as an example, is uh, the administrative users needing access to Windows or Linux servers to do tasks, system maintenance, or other administrative tasks. So if you break down the problem using a zero trust mindset, uh, you might think in the old world, well, give them RDP access to where they can log in with an admin credential, and they know the username and password, and they uh, RDP in to that Windows server, and they have access. And you typically have open network connectivity. Either they make a VPN connection where all the network connectivity ports are open, or they, uh, or they have it on the local network. So you're exposing that server completely to be scanned, probed, attacked. You're also divulging an admin username and password, or you're granting that user admin access to many servers, which again, can leave a trail of privileged credentials to be scooped up later um, and for pass the hash attacks. Now, in a zero trust model, you would not divulge these credentials if possible. You would give the users the access they need, but for a short time period. And it would always be a gateway approach to where they never have direct access. So privilege session management enforces all of these different directives. So you have strong multi-factor authentication. A user can request access to a specific server for a limited time period, requesting the use of privileged ad, uh, admin credentials. And then the access is brokered via the gateway to where the user is interacting with a web page and that on, do not have any network access to the servers, just HTTPS access to a web page. And then the gateway has the RDP access to the server and initiates the session using the vaulted credential on their behalf. So the user gets the access they need to perform administrative tasks without any direct network connectivity and without being divulged the credentials and for just a short period of time, and the session can be recorded. So this is the, the zero trust approach to server access for Windows or Linux servers. The same type of approach can be taken for Windows desktop applications. Uh, in this example, we see a Microsoft SQL Server Management Studio, which is used by uh, users to access and manage databases. So again, applying the proxied approach or the gateway approach, uh, you don't want to grant the user the username and password to access these, this database tool. And you don't want the user themselves to be a database admin or to be an admin. So the privilege application launcher allows a user to check out vaulted credentials and to initiate this desktop application as that identity. Again, just that application, just for a time period, and without having the credentials divulged to them. For web applications, uh, the gateway approach is typically via reverse proxy or API gateway. So this is a gateway in between the user and the applications they're trying to access, which can enforce authentication policies for strong authentication so that no access, anonymous access, will ever touch those web applications or APIs. It terminates on this API gateway, forcing pre-authentication and strong multi-factor authentication. Also, you can enforce very strong and fine-grained authorization to control which pages, APIs, and actions the user can do or see for these web-based resources, including microservices. The gateway will contact Empower ID or another policy decision point to determine if the user is permitted to do the actions or access the pages that they're trying to access at this moment in time in this context from this device, this IP, with this authentication level. And it will block requests that are not allowed, and it will allow requests and log them that are allowed. Now, the gateway can talk to Empower ID in a real-time mode for real-time PDP decisions, or it can use a, a cloud-native technology known as Open Policy Agent, 
where Open Policy Agent runs at the Docker sidecar container, and the gateway, the API gateway, will talk only to the Open Policy Agent to make its decisions. Now, the Open Policy Agent has already consumed the authorization policies defined in Empower ID, so it has the necessary information about who can do what to enforce these decisions locally in a very distributed fashion. You can have as many open policy agents running as needed, and they do not phone home to talk to Empower ID. So they're extremely fast, extremely lightweight, but they're enforcing the same compliant access policies that are designed and authored in the central Empower ID policy administration point. This is an example of OPA in action. So you have the Empower ID API gateway, protecting access to various microservices, reviews, ratings, details, and it's enforcing localized decisions that are authored in the Empower ID system to enforce what the user can do, enforcing pre-authentication and multi-factor authentication, and fine-grained policies over exactly which APIs and which actions they can perform. As an example of different layers of the zero trust model of an end user request coming in from outside to access a web application such as Empower ID or to SSO into something like Office 365, you'll see there are many, many different layers to where the user is never really interacting directly with uh, the target system. You have IP blacklisting at multiple levels. You have access real-time, access checking and authorization checking at multiple levels. And you have adaptive uh, multi-factor authentication at multiple levels. So many layers of access checks before a user has access to a system. So now that we've seen the various methods of how compliant access can be delivered, how do you actually define compliant access? Because compliant access is all about not just evaluating rules and scripts to push access based upon events. It's about defining the model of what does a compliant access look like for each type of person, appropriate access, and that enforces your risk policy. So how can this be defined? So a key technology without which compliant access could not be defined is role-based access control. Because compliant access is based on defining position-appropriate compliant access, which Having the position-appropriate access defined requires having uh, the positions defined. And the technology used to map out what people do or their roles in an organization is role-based access. Now, EmpowerID's role-based access control engine is a three-tiered or three-level role-based access control model, with a top tier being the business role tier, which typically maps to what a person does in the organization a middle functional role tier, which is more dynamic, uh, teams that a user is participating on, projects they're working on, or bundles of access to perform tasks. And then the lowest level is the technical role tier, which ties together the access that you're modeling and the delivery of that access as technical entitlements, application roles or groups, and external systems or permissions. Now, Many organizations over the last few decades have struggled with RBAC technology, and they've had many problems with roles. Often organizations are very shy about approaching a role-based access control project because of previous problems where the roles became more of a problem than the solution. Now, the problem with roles is that in traditional or limited RBAC models, you end up with too many roles. In this example, we can see a banking example where a bank has a teller role. So there are tellers in this organization in all the locations. Now, these locations differ with regional access, country-specific access. So you can't typically have one bank teller role because the access is slightly different by department, by division, or by region. So you end up with a bank teller role for every combination, every region, every city uh, ends up with its own bank teller role. So instead of having a bank teller role, which helps the organization define access, you end up with thousands of bank teller roles, which increases the administrative bur burden. 
This is what's often known as a role explosion or role bloat, and is one of the primary reasons that organizations shy away from RBAC. EmpowerED has solved the role explosion uh, problem. EmpowerED has a solution to it in its unique design of its business role structure. In EmpowerED, the business role tier is the combination between a business role tree and an organizational location or organizational structure tree. So a user never just has a business role assigned to them directly. They always have a business role assigned in conjunction with an organizational uh, location or context, as it's often called. The organizational location tree can represent multiple different types of structures. It can represent geographic structures. It can represent partner company structures and sub-company structures. It can represent, uh, represent business units and divisions and cost centers. And users can be assigned business roles in any of these different contexts. So in our example here, very simple. You have one bank teller business role to which uh, a common access for bank tellers can be assigned. So bank tellers in any location can have a common set of access. Now, users or people are assigned as bank tellers in the context they operate, so in a specific company, division, or geographic region. So they will get receive all of the access assigned to the bank teller business role, and then the exceptions, the access that's context-based, region-based, or location-based can be assigned to the bank teller role in their location. So bank tellers in London would inherit all of the access for bank, teller, bank tellers in general, plus any London bank teller-specific access. This allows users to be assigned to very specific roles in a specific context and access to be assigned generally to the business roles and then specific access to the business roles in those various contexts. This dramatically reduces the number of roles, often bringing the number of roles from competitive solutions, from uh, examples of 20,000 business roles, down to Empower ID customers managing the same size complexity in the same size organizations with 280 business roles. It's a very, uh, very unique technology which solves this critical problem with RBAC. It solves the role explosion problem. Here we can see a depiction of a typical EmpowerED business role and organizational location tree. So you can see on the left, business roles broken out into customer roles, non-employee roles, uh, based on job functions or business roles. These business roles can be designed in EmpowerED completely, but often they come in from the HR system. So EmpowerED business roles such as uh, AP accountant, can map to one or more job titles in HR. That way, when HR assigns a job title to a user or position code, EmpowerED automatically knows through its RBAC mapping technology which is the appropriate business role to assign that person in EmpowerED. And when it changes in the mover process, EmpowerED can readjust that. Locations follow the same model. Locations can come from your HR system, from a Active Directory or LDAP OUs, and again, the EmpowerED locations can be created from those external locations or mapped so that specific OUs and Active Directory LDAP uh, or location codes or cost center codes in HR will be mapped to specific locations in the EmpowerED tree. That way, EmpowerED knows for a person, based upon their primary HR account, which locations they should belong to and can automatically adjust that. You'll see different dimensions represented here in the tree. Uh, geographic dimensions, uh, differentiation types such as company code, controlling area. Uh, so the, the tree can represent really any type of organizational location that's used to represent security and policy. Here we see some person objects that are assigned to these roles and locations. And person objects can be assigned to any number of business roles, but again, each of their business role assignments is in a context or in a location. And that will determine their access, which access is job appropriate for them to have at any moment in time. So the engine knows the appropriate access and can calculate the difference between their appropriate access and their current access to grant and revoke access to maintain the security state.
It's not an event-based system where events happen, data changes, and thing, uh, rules are triggered or fire, and then nothing happens after that. And Power ID is continuously recalculating every 10 minutes what is appropriate access for every person in the system and comparing this to the inventoried state of what is the current state of their access to enforce the adjustments to maintain compliant access at all times. So state-based versus uh, versus uh, event-based is a very big differentiator from Power ID. State-based is always enforcing a continuously compliant state. Event-based triggers based on actions, and it is not continuously monitoring your security state. And Power ID also has many tools to assist an organization with creating or, or discovering these initial roles and role structure. As we mentioned, Empower ID roles and locations at the business level can be imported in and modeled from HR or other systems. But Empower ID also includes role mining analytics. Role mining analytics analyzes all of the inventoried entitlement data, all of your user account records in all your systems, and all of their access, their application role memberships, their group memberships. And it creates campaigns where you can analyze this data. It creates a snapshot of the data that you want to analyze in a campaign. Let's say China versus the U.S. versus business unit A or B. It snapshots the attributes for those users. And then it allows you to analyze it over a period of time by running machine learning algorithms against the data to identify the implicit roles that these users have. Organizations on these various analysis runs can push the data to try to find global roles, as we see here, which are roles that cover a large number of users, but then would have fewer entitlements, such as VPN access or Internet access, roles which grant the baseline access for many people. Also, they can be pushed in the other direction to find roles that grant more access, but to fewer users, which would be the functional roles. These roles can be published and promoted to Empower ID roles, automating the assignment of these entitlements to make them role-based instead of exceptions. So, business processes and functions. So, in an organization, how does the business process modeling relate to the compliant access? So if you look at an organization, organizations can be broken down into a series of business processes that they perform in the course of producing their goods or the services that they deliver. All organizations can be broken down this way. Business processes, if you look at a business process, it's a series of steps or activities, often known as functions, that are performed by the internal participants, the employees of an organization, and then there are some steps performed by external participants, such as a loan processing sign-up. Some processes are done by the company internally, but some processes are done by the, the, the customer externally. These functions need to be performed in order to fulfill the delivery of the good or service. An example of a function might be to create a purchase order. Now, many functions require technical access to be completed. So, in, in most companies, creating a purchase order is done in the ERP system. So, in order for the user to perform this function, they need actual technical access, application roles or entitlements, granted to them in that application so they can log into that system and access the screens and the transactions to create this purchase order. So we see that functions are really the, the link or the bridge that connects the business concepts that an organization performs in its business processes to the technical system access that grants them the abilities in a technical system or application to perform these functions. So it's really what marries together the business understanding of what people do and the technical understanding of how that access is delivered. So identity management kind of sits in the middle between the business and the technology. And in Power ID, its job is to create what's called an anti-corruption layer, the term for microservices, where basically you have something in the middle that allows you to not modify your business logic 
to mold it to the, the, the constraints or the terminology of the technical. So you cannot corrupt how you want to do business by the systems that you employ. That way your business can follow the most optimal model and you can use any systems you want because there's something in the middle there that's translating and adapting and not requiring you to change how you do things. So as we mentioned, functions are really this bridge because an organization has uh, business processes and their business specialists understand these processes, you know, order to cash and and, uh, order to cash to pay. And in these processes, there are the functions that are performed, again, understood completely by the business users and the auditors. Now, these functions, the business specialist knows which functions might be risky. If you can create a purchase order and approve a purchase order, those are two functions which would together create a a, a risk that's unacceptable to the organization because fraud could be committed. So you can create a relationship between these two functions to say that these should be segregated functions, that no person should have these two functions together. Now, this is at the business level. So the functions could exist in any system. You can model this at the business level, and therefore it's independent of the systems. Now, where where the mapping comes in is that business specialists can work with application specialists because the application owners, the SAP owners, the Salesforce owners, they know the application roles or fine-grained uh, permissions that actually grant someone the right to perform those functions in their system. So in SAP, they would know which T code or transaction code, uh, like ME21 or ME21N, grants someone the right to perform a create purchase order function. So by mapping the technical entitlements to the functions, then the system automatically knows, based upon the inventory technical entitlements and which users have access to them, exactly which users can perform which functions. So you can report on function level access as well as these risk policies or toxic combinations. Here's just another view of it. We have your business functions defined at the business level, and you have the mapping of these functions to the various technical entitlements or fine-grained permissions and rights in your technical systems. And therefore, the system knows at all times which users can perform which functions in which systems. Now, a key to defining compliant access and delivering compliant access is that you must be equally sure and and have well-defined what is non-compliant access. Non-compliant access must be defined to ensure that you're only delivering compliant access at all times. Non-compliant access is based upon the concept of risks. Risky access is access that allows a user to do actions that could create fraud or expose the organization to security vulnerabilities or potentially bad actions. So compliant access is access to it adheres to an organization's policies concerning these risks and 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 how the risks define what is acceptable and what must be prohibited. So least privilege, which means granting the, the fewest privileges needed to do the action, the end result, for the least amount of time, in conjunction with compliant access, adds risk policies into the equation. So in order to have least privilege access or compliant access, you must always ensure that this access is not producing unacceptable risks. So identification of these cases where the the risk, uh, a user does have risky access, allows an organization to make informed decisions. So knowing what is risky access and identifying it immediately allows the organization to decide if this access should be revoked, it's unacceptable, or to mitigate and memorialize that, yes, this is an identified risk, but an exception is warranted, and this exception will be monitored and tracked and audited. Organizations can define risks by defining the functions performed by the users and matching which of these functions are risky on their own. So just by having the ability, let's say, to perform password resets, that could be identified as a function that on its own represents a risk that should be overseen, audited, and mitigated. 
Also, organizations can define combinations of functions where, on their own, creating a purchase order might not be considered risky. But the ability to create a purchase order and approve a purchase order would allow a user to commit fraud. So that combination or that uh, of segregated functions that should be kept apart would create a separation of duties violation that would uh, expose the organization to risk. So defining these policies at the functional level allows them to make sense to everyone in the organization so that business users, auditors, and technical IT participants can speak the same language. It also allows um, more coverage of risks so that through an understanding of the risks, you're not missing risks. Risk policy is defined not at the function level, but based on technical entitlements with uh, uh, obscure technical names and descriptions lead to confusion because the business users do not really know the functions that those technical entitlements allow a user to perform. And therefore, users might be granted the ability to perform functions without the, the business users or auditors even knowing it. So it creates security vulnerability. Also, for when a recertification happens or someone needs to mitigate this risk, it's much, much more difficult for a business user to accept and mitigate a risk based upon technical entitlements because of a, a lack of understanding or, or clarity as to all of the access or functions these technical entitlements might allow a user to perform. This is just a screenshot of defining business risks. So business risks can be imported from a system such as SAP GRC, which automatically define the functions that a user can perform in SAP and the risks associated with those functions, or they can be created by the organization itself within Empower ID. Uh, the risk can be defined at a global level and a local level. Now, the global versus local is for organizations that are, have multiple business units or multiple geographic concerns. So that violating a risk in uh, Germany might involve different IT systems or different risk owners than if the same violation happened in France. So that local representation of a risk allows for a different definition of which systems the risk could occur in and who is the risk owner that would mitigate that risk. Uh, the same concept goes for functions, global functions and local functions, because performing that function in one geographic region might be different systems or entitlements than in another region. EmpowerID includes advanced violation reporting. So once the risks are defined and EmpowerID is continuously inventorying the technical entitlements, the engine will find all of the combinations or the violations where users have function level access that represents a risk or a toxic combination. This can be reported on by auditors or business professionals or IT to discover all of these risks that have been identified by the system. And you can see the status of risks that have been unmitigated versus those that have been previously mitigated. In this example, we can see Mokhtar is violating multiple risks that are mitigated and unmitigated. You can see all of the details about the down to the permission or transaction level and how this person received these uh, function level access. Where is it coming from? and whether or not it's mitigated or not. In addition to just preventing and detecting risks and violations, organizations need to perform a regularly scheduled recertification of access so that the business users can view the access and certify that it is still job appropriate. This, if access is not job appropriate, the organization can go back and redefine their policies as to what uh, this person's position should have. Or it might represent that the person has changed position and this needs updated in the system. So access certification is where EmpowerID can snapshot, much like role mining, snapshot the entitlement data of which users have access to which entitlements. And it generates tasks, recertification tasks based upon the type of policy. So for person direct entitlements, which is the policy type to review employees access, these tasks are typically routed to the person's line manager. The line manager would receive a task for each of their direct reports included in the audit campaign to see and view their access and to certify it and, and to mark any access that is not job appropriate 
as uh, requiring revocation to be processed through the fulfillment system. In this case, we can see that Max Planck is certifying his direct report, Erwin Schrodinger, and reviewing his access, and he's currently about 9% complete. Here we see the, the details of this access, which is broken down into two sections. The first section is role-based access. So this, these are the roles that this user has, whether they're business roles or functional roles. And these roles will grant bundles of access. Now, the, the, to make it friendly for the business manager, these roles can be certified instead of the individual entitlements that the roles grant. And the goal in Empower ID would to be have as much of the access granted by roles as possible, with the goal typically being 80% role-based and 20% to be exceptions based upon access requests that have gone through an approval process. Now, when Empower ID comes into an organization, most of the access is not going to be role-based. So managers would have many, many decisions to make on explicit entitlements, often hundreds of them. Now, role mining can optimize that process to convert those hundreds of direct entitlements into a much smaller number of role-based entitlements to, for the managers to certify, therefore making their job easier, more precise, and more refined. So in this screen, the manager can either choose to certify or revoke or even optionally certify for a time period, enter in their justification if desired, and submit their decision for the role-based assignments as well as the explicitly assigned access rights that are not coming from roles. Now, this will go through to the next step, which is a quality check, which is optional, where the, the revocations can be reviewed by the, the organization's security or entitlement team to choose which ones should be processed or not processed. They might choose not to process them if the, the manager was unaware of the need of that technical entitlement. Now, any that are processed will go on for either automatic revocation for systems where they're connected with a connector or for manual fulfillment where they're bundled up into requests for system owners to certify that they have completed that action in the external application and to, to approve that those are completed. Now, on the next data feed from that system, Empower can report that this has been completed. And all of this data is, is reportable for auditors in an exportable format that gives them all of the information they need to complete the audit process.